thank you very much for joining today and uh, we'll be continuing our discussion on the bhagavad gita uh, we are discussing the fourth chapter and i have shared the powerpoint we'll be discussing 448 in the bhagavad gita the topic is who is god does he care why should we care so 48 in the bhagavad gita is a well known verse paritranaya sadhunam vinashaya cha duskritam dharma samsthapanarthaya sambhavami yuge yuge here krishna is saying that i descend to this world repeatedly to bring order in this world to establish dharma dharma i can say is uh, moral and spiritual order at both at an individual and a social level so krishna comes to establish that and when he comes in this way at that time he also dis he empowers the devoted and disempowers the demoniac so let's now i have the slide uh, you have all of you have the powerpoint so i will mention which slide i am speaking on and then you can go to that slide that way we'll have a correlation between our discussions and the uh, visuals i'm not sharing the screen so so the review of what we have done till now the bhagavad gita begins with the question what is it that i am meant to do what is dharma so then to understand what we are meant to do we need to understand who we are and then once i understand i am a spiritual being how do i live in a way to realize my identity so we talked about destiny about work about the search for pleasure about duty various things we talked about then okay this is this knowledge how do we gain that knowledge in the previous session we talked about revelation so revelation is given by god and now god doesn't just give revelation god also descends to ensure that reality or the world is aligned with revelation that means that we all live in a way that is harmonious with the ultimate reality so for that purpose he descends and so this slide 3 is the three things we are going to discuss who is god does he care and why should i care so now <clears throat> revelation it teaches us not just who we are but whose we are that we are not just isolated fragmented beings existing in an uncaring cosmos but that we are parts of a whole so this is slide 5 that we are parts of a whole is bigger than ourselves and the identity of that whole is also revealed now the bhagavad gita will focus on the divine much more from chapter 7 here the focus on the divine is almost like a we could say an a detour when krishna speaks about how i gave this knowledge at the dawn of creation so arjuna asks in 44 that how could you have given this knowledge you are uh, uh, you are you are contemporary to me so were you existing at the dawn of existence so at that time in response to that answer krishna reveals his divinity so krishna's stress is not on his divinity it is more on how to function in the world based on the spiritual identity so 45 to around 415 where 414 where krishna speaks about his own divinity that's a detour and this theme will be elaborated more from the 7th chapter onward but still krishna reveals his identity and uh, he says that i both of us have had many lives before so arjuna when he asks aparam bhavato janma param janma vivasvatah kathame tad bijaniyam tvamadau proktavani ti is how could you have spoken this knowledge krishna says bahuni me vititani janmani tav cha arjuna tanyaham ved sarvani natvam vitta parantapa both of us have gone through many lives but i remember all of them you don't so revelation teaches us about the identity of the divine 
So who is God? At this stage, we will focus on the preliminary understanding and a deeper understanding we'll get in the seventh chapter about specifics about God. So now, when we want to know about God, there are two ways of knowing about him. There is forward reasoning and there is backward reasoning. Explain what I mean by that. Forward reasoning and backward reasoning. So, forward reasoning means we propose God as an axiom. And if we, we accept that God exists and we get a basic definition of God and from there we move forward and then check if God were the founding basis of existence, then is the world the way it should be? If it had been, if God was the first principle of existence. So that is forward reasoning. That means we start forward from accepting God as an axiom. Backward reasoning is we look at the world and then we trace backward to consider whether God exists or not. So did the world as it exists come from God? So for example, when we use the design argument that we see the world is well designed and there are so many evidences that of things that could not have come by itself, then come by just by chance. Then we say that this is an indicator to the existence of God. So we look at the world and then we trace back to the existence of God. So backward, re both of these reasonings have their utility. So what are we trying to do over here? We're trying to address the question of the, of who is God. Krishna has revealed his identity in the Gita and we are trying to arrive at that understanding from a logical perspective before we look at the scriptural perspective. So now either of these reasonings are useful, but backward reasoning sometimes leads to problems. Let's look at what could be the problem. So when I talk about what revelation is telling and what reason is telling. So reason is our rational faculty, our logical analysis. So what is the relationship between reason and revelation? If reason is directed properly, then reason and revelation, this is, we are going to slide nine here now, which is, you show that you see the image of a candle and the image of the sun. So revelation is like the sunlight. Uh, it can it can reveal and show everything. But reason is like the moonlight. Now, revelation requires faith. To understand revelation requires faith. Faith has to dawn in the heart. Just like the sun is not there at night. So, uh, when the sun is not there at that time, we need a candle or we need a moon. We basically, let's compare a candle. Now, candlelight also, uh, once we... Uh, once we can see with the candle, eventually what we see with the candle and what we see with the sun will be the same. But what we see with the sun will be much, much clearer. So revelation can give, give us much, much more clarity in understanding reality. But revelation requires faith, requires purification. And of course, it requires revelation. That means scripture is revealed at one time. The Gita has been revealed at one time by Krishna, but the Gita, what the Gita, how the Gita makes sense, that revelation has to dawn in our own heart. So in that sense, revelation is not just a historical incident, it is an ongoing process. Until that revelation happens in our heart, we can, we can and we should use reason. So reason is like the candlelight, which can show us one step ahead, one step ahead as we move on. So we are trying to look at reason as a means to understand God. So what can we understand from reason? So to slide 10, reason can tell us about God's existence, whereas revelation can tell us about God's nature. What this means is the difference is that God exists. We can, re we can make a reasonable inference about that from reason. Like I said earlier, a design, there are various arguments which are used. There is the design argument, there is the moral argument, there is the ontological argument, uh, <clears throat> there is the cosmological argument. We won't go into all these arguments. But these, are, these have been debated by philosophers uh, for quite some amount of time. So a reasonable inference can be made about God's existence. But 
What about God as a person? Not just God as the creator of the world, but God is self-existence. That we can't understand except through, except through revelation. So, <clears throat> so in we have the existence and the self-existence, we could say. So the self-existence, the self-existential nature of God, we understand through revelation. And in that way, both can illumine the same reality with a greater clarity. Now, when we look, what is the Gita's revelation about God? It says God is Krishna. Is who Krishna is? We'll discuss about him further. But at this stage, he says he's Krishna. He is the transcendental ultimate reality. Who ex this is slide eleven now? Who exists beyond this world and descends period periodically to this world? That ajopi sanavyaatma bhutana mishvaropisan. Krishna says that he exists beyond this world as the divine being. And periodically he descends to this world. Sambhavami yuge yuge. So this is the I, this is the basically who is God? God is a transcendental person. And this we now let's look at how reason and revelation can apply for a further step forward. Now at one level, we may okay, if there is a God. A big question comes up, does he care? So one of the strongest arguments used against the, the, against the existence of God is the so-called problem of evil. The problem of evil is that if God exists and if God is good, then why is there so much misery in the world? Why is there so much evil in this world? That it indicates, does it indicate that God doesn't exist? Or if we say that God does exist, then does he really care? How do we reconcile the enormous suffering we see in the world with the idea of a good God, a benevolent God? So for this purpose, now let's look at something here. We can look at slide 13 and here we can see the basic problem with respect to revelation. So what do evidence and reason say? At one level we can say God cares. Why does he care? Because there is so many, there is so much right in this world. So many things are right in the world. We discussed in an earlier session about how heat, light, air, water, all these are provided for. And when these are provided for, that indicates that there is a benevolent, there is a, some benevolent arrangement for all these. And when it, if we have to, we can realize the value of these things when they are not there. We may not think of water much, but when we are desperately thirsty, we realize how invaluable it is. So, so many things are right in the world and they surely need some arrangement uh, to have come through. So, so that is one indication that God cares. But then we can also give contrary evidence that God doesn't care. Because there are so many things are wrong in the world. What are the things? Now we could say, okay, if you say that God arranges for rains, then there are, there are torrential rains which lead to floods and which lead to devastation. There are rains which don't come at all and then that leads to droughts and death. So all the things that we can call as provisions also lead to tribulations. So oh, there is food, but then there are so many there are times throughout human history when food is not there. So that leads to enormous suffering. So, so now so the those who are theists can point to all the things that suggest that God cares. And atheists can point to the things which suggest that God doesn't care. And in that way, both can substantiate their own belief. Now the fundamental problem over here is, is this is the problem with backward reasoning. I talked about those two reasonings, backward and forward. Backward reasoning presumes that this world is is what it is, is the reality. And based on the reality of this world, we can infer whether God exists or not. Uh, oh, from a philosophical perspective, we'll discuss the conception of free will much more later. But at this stage, 
from a philosophical perspective, God has given each one of us free will. And the free will means he can, he gives us the free will whether to accept him or to reject him. And it, this is not just an act of our personal independence, but it is also a matter of cosmic dispensation. That means God has arranged the world in such a way that those who want to turn toward him will see the evidence that supports their wanting to turn toward him. And those who want to turn away from him can also find evidence to turn away from him. So God provides for the free use of free will in both ways. And that's why uh, both theists and atheists can come up with evidence to support their own their own their own beliefs. So that's why backward reasoning can sometimes be inconclusive. So the sheer amount of suffering in the world can be seen as a refutation of God's existence. So that's why uh, more now the design argument can be used, no doubt. And it can convince people to some extent. And it's useful to that extent. But both in the Indian tradition as well as the Western tradition, the inadequacies of design argument have been pointed out. Ramanujacharya, in his commentary on the Vedanta Sutra, in the third sutra, Shastra Yonitvat, he says that, the, he also quotes a similar argument that he says, given that there is so much suffering in the world, there are three prominent arguments that are given. One of them is that maybe, yes, there's so much suffering in the world. Maybe the being who has created this world is an evil being, some demon, some Satan, that it's not a good God, but an evil Satan. So given the suffering in the world, that could also be an inference. So he says that, that the, the, Arguments like the design argument are not conclusive. Now, this is not to say that they are not useful, but they are not conclusive. And if you want conclusive knowledge, he says Shastra Yonitvat. We need to turn toward revelation. So revelation means it's like forward reasoning, not backward reasoning. We first understand about God from the revelation, understand God as an axiomatic principle. And then understanding that nature, we look at the world around us and see if the world is as it would expect it to be. So, basically, when we start with forward reasoning, not backward reasoning, not from the world to God, but understand God as an axiom and move forward to the world, the Gita's revelation tells us first two things, that reality, this world is not the ultimate reality, reality is two level. And the spiritual level of reality is our home, and the material level of reality is like a hospital. Now, why particularly a hospital? In a hospital, we will see these two things simultaneously. So we are going now to the, can come to slide 16 first, and then we'll go to 15. So if you see, atheists point, atheists point to all the design in the world, and the, atheists point to all the distress in the world. And... Is there a place where we have both a design and distress? Yes, that is a hospital. One example of that is a hospital. In a hospital, things are very well designed. So this department is for this purpose. This is how the supplies come here. This is how all the arrangements for this particular process, procedure are readily made, are systematically made. So there is, there is no doubt about the presence of design in a hospital. But at the same time, there is no doubt about the presence of distress in a hospital. Just as a hospital has both design and distress, so just the presence of distress does not disprove design and the presence of design does not necessitate the absence of distress. I repeat this, that atheists argue that because there is distress, there cannot be a good God. But does the presence of distress disprove uh, design. Not necessarily. We always have to consider design in the light of the purpose. We have to consider design in the light of the purpose. If I use if I use a small phone to type a book 
and then I say this keyboard is so 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 small, so messy. I can't type it. Well, a phone is not meant for typing a book, and any design can be faulted if we divorce it from its purpose. The the util the a true a design has to be seen in the light of what its purpose is. So the material world, when when we think of this as our home and think of how God how good a home God has made us, then we will always find that things are not good enough. There are a lot of things that are bad. But if we see this world as a hospital, then there is design and there is distress both. Now, of course, one important point is that. The hospital doesn't cause distress. Distress is there in the hospital because people are deceased. Similarly, the world's purpose is not to cause us distress. Distress is a feature of the world, not the purpose of the world. So, just as distress is feature of the hospital, it's just there. So, now how? What is that? What What does all this have to got to do with our driving question? Our question is: Does God care? So, to understand how God cares. we need to understand the purpose of the world so god cares for us if this world is a hospital he cares for us so that we get treated and we come from the hospital to the home so that you can go to slide 15 now so there is a spiritual level of reality and there is a material level of reality and <laughs> the material level is like a hospital the spiritual level is the home and god's care is is in what way seen he cares so much that he descends from the spiritual level to the material level to help us become treated and then we go to the spiritual level so god's descent from the spiritual level to the material level is called the avatar and that is what is discussed in this verse when krishna says avatar is descent the word avatar literally means avatariti one who descends from a higher level of reality to this level is called as avatar the of course in today's world the word avatar is also used in another context in the context of say online gaming or video games where people have their their representation in the digital world which is called as avatar there is also a movie bo avatar which had a similar idea so basically in that there the idea of the avatar is something which is transported or from the physical world to the digital world so the original context of that word avatar is from the spiritual to the to the physical so the god descends from the spiritual world to the material world and that is called as avatar now his purpose is twofold one purpose is if in a hospital everything is going chaotically then the hospital order has to be restored but the purpose when a, even when a hospital is orderly that doesn't mean the hospital will ever be as comfortable as a home the order in the hospital is so that the patients can be treated and then discharged and they can go back home so similarly god's purpose is to establish dharma in this world to establish order in the world but that order will not go is not going to make this world a uh, forever happy place that order will enable us to treat ourselves to raise our consciousness to the spiritual level and to attain the spiritual level of reality which is our eternal home so this is uh, the next verse 4 9 where krishna says in the gita janma karma ch me divyam evam yo vetti tatvatah tyaktva deham punar janma naiti mame ti so arjuna that i descend to this that if you understand my appearance and activities you will become attracted to me and you will become attracted to me you will become devoted to me and you will attain me attain me in my abode at the spiritual level of reality so god's purpose is both twofold so if you want to understand whether god cares we can't just look at the world and think that why this world will one day become as comfortable as a cozy home and that will show that god cares no we can look for god's care in his provision of the resources for living in this world in a way that we can heal ourselves now what is the disease we are having the disease essentially is misdirected desires 
we are eternal beings but our desires are directed to a temporary things and we are looking for eternal happiness in things that are temporary and that is the disease which causes our distress so god comes to redirect our desires from the temporary to the eternal now now how does god care so he descends this is we are coming to slide 17 now he descends to guide and guard us from making things worse in this world and for raising us beyond this world that means that his purpose in descending to the world is that he is, so when we live in according to dharma at the very least we don't make things worse so life will bring distress in its own way say some storm comes it's the distressful but during the storm if people instead of helping each other start plundering each other then that will make things worse so when dharma is established then at the very least we don't make things worse so the hospital is working in orderly way and then by that we gradually become purified and spiritualized and we raise we become raised beyond this world so now that brings us to the third part why should i care why should i care means well does god exist does he care who is god why should i care about all these <clears throat> many people an increasing number of people in the first world in europe america australia when they are asked about their their religious orientation they say that they are they are none none means they don't belong to any religion so this is sometimes called as apatheism there is theism there is atheism which is god exists god doesn't exist there is agnosticism which we can't know about whether god exists or not and there is apatheism which i just don't care whether god exists or not so more and more people nowadays are gravitating towards that and there are reasons for it um <clears throat> there is of course one thing is religious sectarianism and extremism and violence which makes people feel that i don't want to have anything to do with this religion stuff and we will talk about religious extremism in our next session uh, about various religions and various revelations in 411 but at this point there is this idea that why should i bother about all this stuff so why should i care that will be the last part of our talk so traditionally people felt the need for god because they felt that they cannot fulfill their needs and desires on their own so for example there is a famous biblical prayer o father thou art in heaven hallowed be thy name give us our daily bread so this prayer indicates that god is a cosmic provider and say when people lived with greater uncertainty then they felt that maybe we need god so that he will provide us our daily bread and today's world yes there are still uh, there are still a lot of hungry people in various parts of the world but many people who feel that their needs are provided for then i don't need god and i have the government which is providing me things or i have my own talents and abilities by which i can fulfill my needs and nowadays the technology also for facilitating providing many comforts and luxuries will feel like i can get my desires also fulfilled so if we have the vision of god as the fulfiller of our needs and desires one problem could be that we see in this world there are so many things you are not provided for the other problem could be that if i can provide for those things without god then why why should i care whether god exists or not so we are uh addressing a different point here that first is that oh there is so much distress in the world how can there be god now the other point which i'm making is that yeah you know i can enjoy life without god why do i need to care for god at all so this brings us to a very important point which is in many ways foundational for spiritual growth that fulfilling our needs and desires doesn't bring fulfillment 
fulfilling our this is slide 19 as we're going ahead fulfilling our line our needs and desires doesn't bring fulfillment let's look first at our needs <clears throat> we have need for food we have need for water and it's vital so not having these needs fulfilled is great misery so in that sense that's why we call use the word needs for them we have to have them fulfilled but just having those needs fulfilled doesn't bring fulfillment once our once we have food we have water we have shelter and after that what next we want something to bring a meaning adventure fulfillment in our life and just fulfilling our needs doesn't bring fulfillment so in a sense we could say that our needs are like the fuel for a car they are essential if you want to drive the car but just having a fuel doesn't uh, doesn't mean that that's all that we need we want something more what do i do with it so our fulfilling our needs doesn't bring fulfillment not having those needs fulfilled definitely brings frustration so we are all longing for fulfillment in our life going further fulfilling our desires does does that bring fulfillment strangely what increasingly in modern and postmodern times we are finding is that fulfilling our desires doesn't bring fulfillment of course this is an eternal reality but even amid the increasingly aggressive materialistic propaganda in today's world many people are realizing that actually no uh, i may have my desires I, i want a big car i want a big house and i want an attractive partner i want a a uh, prestigious position in society and even if i get all these things after that i find that something is missing in my life these desires even after they are fulfilled i feel like what more there has to be something more in my life and we keep craving for more and more and we stay dissatisfied and why is that we have in many ways uh, we have today even a average middle class person today has comforts that were unimaginable for royalty a few centuries ago we have air conditioning we have air travel we have telecommunications and we have so much entertainment but people are far more mentally troubled people are far more so trouble that we, uh, in history as far as records we have more people are suicidal today than ever before so why is that that's there is something missing so fulfilling if, if we are thinking that well, that i don't need to care for god because i can fulfill my needs and desires by my own means well that doesn't work it won't bring fulfillment what do we need we need to care let's we bring the next slide now this is the 20th slide that our longing for lasting happiness can't be fulfilled in this world why because everything in the world is temporary even the best pleasures in the world are temporary so it can be fulfilled by understanding that god is not the fulfiller of our desires but the also the fulfillment of our desires that god is a all attractive supreme person and that he is meant to be the object of our love when we learn to direct our love towards him and become devoted to him in that loving connection we get the supreme satisfaction it is that loving connection that is the bhagavad gita's ultimate uh, ultimate direction so we should we need to care for god not because he will provide us the things that we'll care that we care for or we we feel we don't care for him because he is not providing us the things we do, we care for but rather he is he is the being in connecting with him will bring us the supreme fulfillment it's not just fulfillment beyond this world but even in this world when we become connected with him when we become absorbed in him we can experience fulfillment so we discussed in earlier session how connection and contribution bring real satisfaction that that connection with the divine internally and contribution in a mode of service to the divine externally that's what brings us satisfaction 
So this is what the Bhagavad Gita will lead towards. And I'll summarize. And we, I'm keeping a lot of time for questions today. And so I'll summarize what I've spoken. I talked about this theme of who is God? Does he care? Why should I care? Based on 4, 8 and then 4, 9 the Bhagavad Gita. We talked about first that the Bhagavad Gita is saying God descends to this world periodically. And if you want to know who is God, there are two ways of knowing. There is forward reasoning and backward reasoning. So backward reasoning means that we start from the world and try to infer from here uh, with the, what is the nature of reality. Is there, is there God? And forward reasoning is that we start from God as an axiomatic principle with the basic understanding of God as given through revelation. And then we look at the nature of the world and see if it makes sense. So reason is, you could say in some ways, backward reasoning. We start from the world, the path of reason. The path of revelation is forward reasoning. We start from God. Both of them can point us in the same direction. Both of them can provide us light. The light from reason is like a candlelight or moonlight. The light from revelation is like sunlight. So as long as we don't have sunlight, says night, then we do need the moonlight or the candlelight. So similarly, till revelation has not manifested in our lives and in our hearts, we don't need to use reason as an indispensable tool. But at the same time, what is revealed through reason dimly is what is understood or what is in, what is uh, understood through reason dimly is understood through revelation clearly. So through reason, what can we know about God's about God per se? We can look at the many things that are provided for us in life and we can infer God's existence. So that is the various argument like design argument and others. But just like a candlelight doesn't show us the full reality, reason can be used in the other way also. You can say there are so many things provided for, but there are so many things which are not provided for. So therefore, uh, the design argument in mainstream philosophy is considered to be uh, inconclusive. Although it is useful, but it is not a definitive argument. And Ramanacharya says that in his commentary to Shastra Yonitvat that, if we want to know about, we could make a, if you want to infer simply from the world, we see design and distress both in the world. And we could infer that there is, a, there is an evil being who has made the world also. That's what Immanuel Kant also in the Western philosophy suggests inferred. That could be a possible inference also. So now we discuss, so then what is the way of forward reasoning? We start with revelation and revelation tells us that this world is not the ground of reality. There are two levels of reality, physical, material and spiritual. And the spiritual real level of reality is our home. The material is like a hospital. We are here because our desires are deceased. Although we are eternal beings, we are looking for pleasure in temporary things. And God, does God care? If you want to look for it, we need to look not just for whether God has made provisions in this world to make it a wonderful home for us, but whether the provisions here are sufficient for it to be in hospital. So God, we talked about the, how God descends from the spiritual to the material level as the avatar to inspire us to ascend, to raise our consciousness from the material to the spiritual level. So the world provides us enough facilities so that we can treat ourselves and grow spiritually. If we want to be simply materially happy, then there is never going to be enough in this world for us to be materially happy. Just as if somebody wants to just enjoy, enjoy feasts of food, well, the hospital menu is never going to satisfy that. If one wants to eat food enough to be healthy or to become healthy, yes, the hospital will provide that. So the world provides for our needs and provides for our desires in moderation, but it's not a place of enjoyment per se. It's a place for treatment. And of course, in the hospital also, the order is to be maintained. And if the hospital becomes disorderly, then God himself descends to this world to set up order. But the order is not to make the world into a home, but the order is that the world functions as an orderly hospital. That we can practice dharma 
and become treated. And that's why 4.8, which talks about God descending to establish order, is immediately followed by 4.9, which is God, estab God establishes order by, so that we can become attracted to him and attain his world. So why should we, so God's care has to be seen in the facilities he provides for us to treat ourselves and to elevate ourselves. And then why should we care if we feel, I don't care about this whole spiritual stuff. But then even if we can get our needs fulfilled and desires fulfilled on our own, that will not bring fulfillment. If you want fulfillment, our heart will not find it in temporary things. We need to redirect our heart toward the spiritual. And that redirection comes by understanding the truth of the Gita's revelation that God is an all-attractive person who is not just the fulfillment, who is not just a fulfiller of our desires, but also the fulfillment of our desires. And as when we make our make him our object of love, then we can find contentment in this life and we can progress towards liberation beyond this life, beyond this world. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. So, oh, are there any questions? So, uh, there's a question by um, Vishakha Agarwal. Uh, why is suffering there in the world? The, per the Is it there to bring us to our knees? Our senses, it's force us, so force surrender, that if we don't surrender, we suffer. Well, that is one way of looking at it, but it's an oversimplified way of looking at it. That is the world designed to force us to surrender? Well, yes and no. The basic point is there is an existential incompatibility. That the world is temporary and we are eternal beings. The world provides us temporary pleasure, whereas we want lasting happiness. And that existential incompatibility itself is the cause of suffering. Now, beyond this existential incompatibility, there are other specific causes of suffering. And we often take those causes of suffering very seriously. So during the course of our life, somebody, somebody steals something from us, somebody insults us, uh, <clears throat> say the stock market crashes, we lose our job. Now, these are the sufferings which we take very seriously. Some relationship goes downhill. And these are sufferings, no doubt. But uh, there is a difference uh, between, say, these sufferings. The, often in, say, in the Abrahamic religions, in the Christian tradition, the problem of evil is often defined as, why do bad things happen to good people? Say, why do children suffer some terrible disease or something like that? Now, these are definitely serious sufferings. But when the Bhagavad Gita talks about the distresses of the world, I mean, the Vedanta Sutra talks about distresses, it doesn't talk about these circumstantial distresses. It talks about existential distresses. Circumstantial distresses are that the circumstances become distressful. Now, some, uh, now we can say that for some people, the circumstances are terrible in their lives. For others, also, they're, they're, they're tough, but they're not that terrible. But whether we have a uh, terrible life or a not so terrible life, the existential distresses are there is old age, there is disease, there is death, and then there will be rebirth. Janma Vrityu Jara Avyadhi Dukkha Doshanu Darshanam. So, the circum beyond the circumstantial distresses are the existential distresses. Circumstantial means based on circumstances, they come and they may come more or less in some people's life, but existential means they are there for everyone. Now, why are these existential distresses there? The existential distresses are there because we are temporary beings and we are seeking a pleasure in, sorry, we are eternal beings and we are seeking pleasure in temporary things. That, that existential incompatibility is the cause of all existential distresses. And beyond that, uh, there is the principle of karma, which we'll be discussing later. That bhutana mintha kali, that we ourselves act in ways that make things worse. So, it is not that God is malicious and God has made this world a place of misery. Rather, it is we, with our misdirected desires, have set up a situation where misery is inevitable. It's, it's just 
in the very nature of in the very fabric of existence misery is there because of the incompatibility of our longings and our of our aspirations and our situations our aspirations are for lasting happiness our situation is things are temporary now through this all the purpose ultimately is that we evolve spiritually so it is not that suffering alone is meant that suffering is meant to for us to evolve the suffering is meant for our evolution even pleasure is meant for our evolution everything in this world is meant to help us direct towards god so if we get sufferings in this world they can remind us oh there is there this world is not a place of happiness let me turn toward god through this but even the pleasure in this world that can also be a pointer toward god that we'll see in the 10th chapter that everything attractive in this world manifests a spark of krishna's splendor that means when we see something attractive uh, that attractiveness is not just illusory it's just like when a person in the hospital when they are sick that gives them how oh, i want to become healthy but when they experience some good health they experience some relief some some pleasure oh i want to move in this direction so even the pleasures in this world can point us toward god if we can see them as connected with god as uh, as mm, the attractive objects of this world are manifestations of the divine so yes everything in this world to make made meant to take us toward god hmm it's both the pleasures and the pains everything okay now from mayank kumar there's a second question in five five it is said analytical study is same as devotional service does it throw some light on forward and backward reasoning can analytical study lead to backward reasoning well analytical study is the same as backward reasoning uh analytical study we, backward reasoning means we start from the world we analyze the world and we move toward um, we move toward the <clears throat> we move toward the nature of ultimate reality it's inferential logic so backward reasoning is fine and that particular verse 555 which says there prabhupada is using it in slightly different sense that is krishna is talking about the paths of sankhya and karma sankhya yoga and yoga sankhya yoga pratak bala pravadanti na pandita ekam apya astita samyak ubhayor vindate phalam so those verses they talk about how we will come there later but basically the path of analysis and the path of service both ultimately can take us to the same reality now when sankhya is talked about sankhya as it is talked about in the bhagavad gita is also based on shastra so that's not exactly backward reasoning although there is an element of backward reasoning in it let's reserve that uh, for a future session <clears throat> so why do we come to the hospital <clears throat> we have free will and the very existence of free will implies that there has to be an arena for the exercise of free will Um, so, if a boy says to a girl, proposes to a girl with you know bowing down on knees, offering a flower ring, please marry me. And she says no. And the boy takes out a gun and shoot and says, "I'll shoot you if you don't marry me." Well, that's not love. Love means there has to be free will, and God has given us. He wants us to love Him, and love means He gives us free will. So now, free will means there has to be the possibility for the misuse of the free will also. so the world is an arena for us to exercise our free will in a way that we can we can do two things there is ex- experimentation and there is redirection that we experiment with our various desires using our free will in various ways and then there is rectification we learn that what is the best use of our free will and we direct our desires accordingly okay then this question that taking god as a axiom axiomatic truth can be dismissed by atheists as blind belief how do we counter this argument yes that's a big subject and i'll come to we'll come to this a little later in the session but i'll explain briefly now every school of thought has to begin with some axioms something which is axiomatic so now is there an ultimate reality 
with which we begin. Uh, if we look at the atheistic worldview, the, the atheists have to begin somewhere. And they have begun in various ways with, uh, with a singularity. Now, singularity is basically a point of infinite density and infinite mass and infinitesimal volume filled with uh, which got activated, exploded. And then all of existence came out from that. Now, what is the basis for the existence of that singularity? Uh, did it, was it complete in itself? If it is complete, then why did it have to get activated and explode? If it was not complete, then what was that external agent that activated it? And more importantly, where did it come from? And not only where did it come from, uh, from that explosion of singularity, there is the universe as it exists has precise, has incredible level of precision in it. So how did that precision come about? Now uh, to get around this, uh, some atheists propose uh, cyclic universes, multiple universes. They say that there is a big bang and there's a big crunch and there's a big bang and there's a big crunch. And after each big, big crunch means the universe ex expands and then shrinks and expands and then shrinks. And then there's not only this is happening eternally, but this is also that this is happening in multiple trajectories. So if the probability say of from a initial singularity for the world to come about is 10 raised to the minus, th minus 63. So there are different probabilities given for this whole, for the world as we exist to come from the start of the universe. So now this probability, according to some scientific statistics itself, is actually less than the probability of one atom. That number 10 raised to 63 is actually more than the probability of finding one atom of shooting an arrow and hitting one particular atom at the other extreme of the universe. So how can this probability come about? So scientists say that as low as the probability, again not scientists, atheists, they say that there are as many universes as, as are needed. So there are, if the probability of the universe coming about to be 10, 10 raised to 63, uh, then it's that much probability. So this idea of infinitely cycling universes or infinite, of infinite number of universes, but these fit more the arena of science fiction than science. And they are proposed primarily to get away from the implication of some transcendental, some element, transcendental source and transcendental overseer. So then what happens is, if we don't accept God as the axiomatic truth, you are ex accepting uh, millions of universes and existing or existing and recycling over millions of times as axiomatic truth. Because very important point, none of these, uh, the, the idea of cyclic, cyclic, eternally cycling universe or multiple universes, they have absolutely no empirical evidence. They, ha they can have some sketchy evidential inference from some particular theories which can also be interpreted in many different ways. So what science, what not even science, I would say atheistic science or atheism requires us to believe is infinitely more complicated than one, one transcendental being. So it is not that... Uh, axiomatic approach that calls for blind belief. It is belief is required in every approach, especially when you go to ultimate realities. And the atheistic approach actually requires far greater belief, far, far greater and far more irrational belief than what the theistic approach requires. So, So we tend to make the wrong choice and go back to square one when we started and regret later how to avoid this cycle. Well, it's not necessary that we 
is it good to ask god to pray for us to use our free will properly yes mm. so yes definitely we can seek guidance from god and it's important that we we seek guidance so that we can choose wisely and act wisely no doubt about that having said that <clears throat> it's not that we go back to square one externally it might appear like that but every exercise of choice even a small choice done positively takes us forward and i discussed in the previous session on <clears throat> how the when the floor is inclined in a particular way there is restriction redirection and reconstruction you can hear that class on 336 37 so it's a gradual incremental process by which our free will might be in used in a destructive way right now but we can uh, we can learn to redirect it and use it in a constructive way so even if the free will is being used wrongly at some times rather than focusing and obsessing over those times we focus on the remaining times and try to use our free will as rightly as possible in the remaining times and by that slowly a positive habit will be developed and that positive habit will help us to counter the negative habit so focus more on connecting with krishna or connecting with uh, using the free will well when we can so that will help us develop a good habit so our bad habits like a, are like a formidable weapon like a enemy attacking us with a formidable with a powerful weapon and we no matter how determined we are we are weaponless and not trying to fight we will get slaughtered so rather than trying to fight with that enemy with our bare arm with our with our bare hands we focus on trying to get another weapon so that weapon is the weapon of good habits especially devotional habits habits which help us to become connected with and absorbed in krishna what do they do as we keep developing that now the development of good habits does not require the cessation of bad habits even if i have bad habits still i can develop good habits and when i develop good habits that empowers me and that empowerment enables me to uh Uh, that becomes like an empowerment and once we develop a good habit we can easily think about those things so if we habituate ourselves to do connecting with krishna then when the bad habits start attacking us we can direct our thoughts of toward krishna and that becomes our defense and our counter attack both so focus on focus on developing good habits and gradually the negative habits will fall apart one last question Mm, what are the this is from subha to are there different kinds of avatars <clears throat> this is a technical subject and uh, i wouldn't want to go into this at this stage the bhagavad gita talks about avatars in a particular sense in fact the bhagavad gita does not use the word avatar anywhere although the concept is quite prominent here but that whole idea of of crossing over from one level of reality to another level of reality that is the essence of avatars so the divine manifests at various levels so purusha avatars in the sankhya philosophy there is a purusha and prakriti are two fundamental entities there is matter and there is consciousness and then consciousness is finite and infinite consciousness so purusha avatars refer to the we could say the, the manifestations of the divine who are co-eternal with existence and they make make sure that the existence is maintained so they are avatars in the sense that they also are manifestations of the divine from the spiritual to the material realms but they are just as prakriti is eternal purusha is also eternal so they coexist so mahavishnu garva daksha vishnu shiva daksha vishnu those are considered to be the purusha avatars basically they are the manifestations of the divine who maintain material order uh invisibly immanently within the world then leela avatars the guna avatars are there are three modes of material nature and the avatars which oversee these modes so again there is a linking between the spiritual and the material but for a specific purpose in the material that is overseeing the uh, maintenance of the modes maintenance overseeing the functioning of the modes that is the guna avatars 
Leela avatars refer to those of the those divine avatars who come here primarily to perform pastimes to do leela and thereby to exhibit those attractive things in this world which can attract us uh, to the lords about beyond this world then shaktiavish avatar refers to human beings who are given a divine energy and they uh, they are again they are humans but they are manifesting something which is transhuman in that sense it's an avatar manvantar avatar refers to the avatars who come within each manvantar and there is a say the cosmic administration there is disorder and there is reordering of the cosmic manifestation so this is done in every manvantar it is done in every yuga also so thank you very much hare krishna